We're beginning a new series this morning called Common Challenges. There are things that are true just because you're human. And so we want to talk about those from a biblical perspective because often our responses to those challenges are what give us our biggest uh, problems. And so there are or can be unique or different responses to common challenges. And so this morning we're beginning uh, with, quite honestly, with a story that is problematic for the modern person, whether you are religious or non-religious. Uh, this story will bother you no matter who you are. If, uh, for those of you who think that the Bible was edited by single source individuals who just wanted to keep certain hierarchies and the male gender in place and control, you should know that if that really happened, they would take out stories like this from the Bible. Uh, the, this just creates more problems than you can possibly imagine. And so we're looking at 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter, beginning in verse 10, where it says, the word of the uh, Lord came to Samuel. Samuel's a prophet. God says, I regret that I have made Saul king. It's just such a phenomenal statement for God to make. Because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor, and he has turned and gone down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is the lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. Went a little California on there, on us, didn't he, there? So it's the story of God rejecting King Saul, and this is problematic, first of all, for the non religious person. It starts with the fact that God actually commanded Saul and the armies of Israel to attack the Amalekites and completely destroy their culture. And there are lots of people who just go, yeah, see, that's one of the problems I have with religion. That's one of the problems I have with Christianity is, is that's in a book that you believe and you think it's okay. You know, how do you justify someone going in and destroying a complete nation state? Well, someone who would say that is missing a lot of information. For example, the Amalekites were actually genocidal terrorists. You know, our culture, if people, if there were nations like this today, the nations of our world would stand in unison asking for their destruction because of the things they did. For over 300 years, they assaulted the Israelites from their first interaction when they were first entering the Promised Land until now. They would attack the weak. They would prey upon the, the, uh, the, the poor. They would wait until you were unprepared. For years, they were part of raiding bands of people that would come into the nation. They would let the nation of Israel do all the work of planting and cultivating and right up to the point of harvest, and then they would invade the land. The Bible says like locusts. And they would destroy, they would take whatever they could carry out for their own profit, and then they would destroy everything else so that the weak and the poor would actually starve. On top of that, they would attack you when you were weary. The things that they did to women and their children are unbelievable and quite honestly unspeakable. They had been warned, they had been confronted, they'd even lost in combat as though God was trying to put a warning shot across their bow saying, you guys need to pay attention to what's going on here. If such a group lived today, there would be international outcry that something would be done about it. And this is the problem that the modern non-religious person has with God. The only thing that makes them more angry than God not doing something about evil in the world is when God does something about evil in the world. It's a real problem. So from the oldest to the youngest, that culture was indoctrinated with inhumane treatment of anyone who perceived they perceived as being weak, sick, or unprepared. And like a cancer, they had just infected the region around them. And so like a cancer, God says, that has to be removed. You can see why this is problematic for the modern non-religious person, but it's also problematic for the modern religious person because there's a king who's being removed. He's being rejected by God. 
And he seems to be doing pretty well. I mean, he had a successful military campaign. They did win. And uh, he is engaged in uh, spiritual acts of worship. It's true, he, he didn't follow everything to the T, but I mean, he did do most of what God asked him. Uh, but here's the thing, God refuses Saul's sacrifices, and when God refuses any of our sacrifices, it makes us really uncomfortable. Like, what's the basis for that? And we start worrying. And this story actually uncovers something that's in each and every one of us, and it calls it out. It identifies it, and it calls it out. And that's why this is such a helpful story for the modern person, whether you are religious or non-religious. By the way, that passage started by saying God said he regretted that he made Saul king of Israel. If you have other translations, it'll even say this. Said God says, I repent that I made. So is God saying he sinned or made a mistake? Because we kind of work on the assumption that that's not what God does. That word it's actually used multiple times throughout the Old Testament. It's, it has lots of nuances and variations. And, and the word that probably best describes it is, is found in Genesis 6, when God saw how everyone in the world at that time, there, there was no safe place for people to go. Everyone was looking to increase evil. And the, the result was the judgment of flood that came. And, and the Bible says it grieved God. That's the word. That's the same word. That when he looks at Saul, he is so grieved by what he is seeing. He knows this man cannot remain in place. So, there are other people in Christianity who believe that God actually caused Saul to do all of this. Or at least he put Saul in place because he knew Saul would do all of these things. He kind of predetermined that it would be this way. The nation of Israel had not lived under kings before. The people demanded it. God gave them one, and he just gave them one that he knew would cause them problems to teach them a lesson. That's what some people believe. The challenge is all you have to go is two verses earlier, and you find this verse where it's, uh, this is Samuel once again talking to, uh, to Saul. And he says, you have not kept the command that the Lord God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. If you had just done what he said, it would be your lineage. You'd be the king in your family for all time. So what this passage calls us to is that our choices really matter. So Saul goes to meet, uh, or Samuel goes to meet Saul, and uh, Saul comes out. He says, the Lord bless you. I have done the Lord's instructions. I mean, he's just very excited about this. And uh, Saul, Samuel does something that's really interesting. By the way, we could learn a lot from Samuel's uh, strategies here. He comes in, and we know he was so angry that he cried out to the Lord all night long, but he comes in, and he doesn't come in with accusations, and he doesn't come in with declarations. He comes in with questions. He actually asks Saul three questions because he's not just wanting to set the record straight. He wants Saul to see something in himself, a very important thing. And so the first question that he asks is, what is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Because he was supposed to destroy all the sheep and the cattle. So this is how the universal challenge, this is something that we all face, and this is what I'd like you to see out of this first question, and that is that we all have blind spots. We all have blind spots. It's not just something that happens when you drive your vehicle. We all have things that we don't pay attention to in our lives, and uh, that makes us susceptible in certain ways. So Samuel's walking in, and Saul seems to be oblivious to the sound of all the sheep and the cattle around him. Everybody else can hear it, but Saul seems to be tone deaf to the sounds that exposes disobedience. And uh, uh, as a result of this, God says, this guy can't serve as king. Uh, Samuel comes up with a second question. He says, why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? This brings us to the second nuance of this universal challenge, and that is, is that we're all tempted to use God to get what we really want. There were some things that Saul wanted, and he used the command of God to access it. And Saul is standing and saying, but I did what God commanded. He's, he's being, I mean, he's just not backing up. I did what God asked me. He cannot see his own disobedience objectively. Now, uh, he does mention that the soldiers, you know, they, they did take some sheep and cattle. That is true. 
and uh, mostly for sacrifice to the Lord, and, but we did destroy everything else. Uh, what he's kind of saying here is, these men did what God asked of them. Shouldn't they get something for it? They're the ones who put their lives on the line. They're the ones who are supposed to go home without anything for all of that risk. See, Saul didn't understand that God was not trying to withhold spoils of war. God was trying to enact justice. And those are two very different things. The nations of the world have always attacked other nations. Empires have always attacked other empires. Kings have always attacked other kings in order to gain more wealth, expand their territory, build their empire, and benefit more. That has been the way of the world since the first guy put a crown on his head. This is just how the world works. They've always profited from their empire building. But God wanted to bring justice. And here's the thing. You can't claim you're doing justice when you're making a profit at it. You can't do that. God said, take nothing. Destroy everything. This is blood money. It stops here and it stops now. It's not going forward another day. This is the end of it. But Saul didn't want it to stop. He wanted to grow his own wealth and he wanted to grow his own reputation. It even said in a passage that we read that he had already built up a monument in his own honor. And in fact, when he was supposed to kill the king of Amalek, he actually kept him alive as a living trophy that he could trot out like the other nations around him would do to show how powerful their kings were. And he thought a few sacrifices would cover it all up. This raises an interesting question. And the question is, why doesn't God just destroy the Amalekites himself? Why does he ask people to do his dirty work for him? That's kind of how uh, non-religious people and people of our culture would approach that question. And here's what I want you to see. God doesn't want people to assume that they have no role to play in bringing justice to our world. Passivity in the name of religion has caused more suffering than should have been allowed. We don't just get to sit by when it's a justice issue. Isaiah, the first chapter, this is what the prophet says, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Paul's basic argument is because he has done some things that God asked, he has been obedient. And what he's doing is he's redefining obedience on his terms, which, by the way, he benefits from. Brings us to the third question. Samuel's third question is, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Uh, this is the point that we need to see here. We all believe our good has outweighed our bad. We all think that, I'm not perfect, I get it, but, you know, I think I've done more good than bad. And, and Saul says a, a very interesting thing when he's confronted by this. This is his response. I have sinned. Next word, but. You just know that's a problem, right? I have sinned, but, but please, listen to what he says. Please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. Saul craves being honored. He has to appear as important, significant, and powerful before. And did you, hear what he, did you catch what he said? My people. He claims the people is his. He leaves God to Samuel. Honor me before my people, and then we will go and worship your God. It's just devastating language. That single question exposed so much of King Saul's heart. God did the math. A person who fears others and will do anything for their approval, a person who picks and chooses the parts of God's instructions that they will obey, a person who prizes profit over justice, a person who will cover it up all with a religious ritual, that person will bring unbelievable suffering on the citizens of Israel. Saul will not repent. He blames others. He rationalizes disobedience. He redefines obedience, and he wraps himself in religion while he does it. And here's the most terrifying truth of all of it. We do this too. This is not just some old guy in an ancient culture. When we are confronted, 
We say, I'm sorry, but we all have blind spots. We all blame other people. We all believe that the good we have done outweighs the bad that we have done. What's really interesting is the very next key king in Israel offers this incredible study in contrast. His name is David. And his story is epic. In fact, we have so many details in David's life. It's one of the most uh, prolific amount of information on an Old Testament character that we have in Scripture. It's fascinating to, to look at his life, both the pluses and the minuses of it. And he was guilty of sin, too. In fact, you can make the argument that his sin was even greater because his sin was is that he had an adulterous relationship with a woman who was married, and then he turned around and engaged in a conspiracy to make sure that that man died so that he could have this woman for himself. Well, let's just check. How many here this morning would say, yeah, that's out of bounds? Because, like, if your hand's not up, we're worried about you. <laughs> just keep one eye open with you around. So the prophet Nathan comes to see him just like the prophet Samuel came to see him. And he came in with a story, a parable. It was a fascinating approach. We can learn a lot in Scripture about how to approach situations like this. 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Period. That was it. No excuses, no blaming. He didn't say, you've seen Bathsheba, who can refuse her? She seduced me. He didn't say, you don't understand the pressure of my job. I work really hard, so my resolve got a little bit weary. He didn't say, others are the ones who actually carried out the actions. I just came up with the idea. His blood's not actually on my hands. He didn't say that... Look at all the things I've done for God. Look at all the battles I have won. Look at the kingdom I have built. Look at the buildings that I have erected for his name. No wrapping around himself religious flags. Just a confession. That's all he said. I have sinned. And oddly enough, as impossible as it sounds, it's exactly what is required for grace to flow freely into our lives. If you have a reason that if people if heard they would understand, then you don't need grace. You need understanding. Grace is for people who need forgiveness. And we set ourselves up to not receive the thing we need the most with all our rationalizations and all of our excuses and all of our blaming. So how do we gain ground against this? This universal challenge that is embedded deeply in every human heart. How can we gain some ground on this? And the first is this. Practice community. It's something you're doing right now. Like, you got together with people. When you get together with people, you spend time with them. And when you spend time with them, they can see things in you. Sometimes they'll feed back some information. They'll ask if you're doing okay. They'll, they'll, see, they'll say, maybe you seem a little distracted today. Or, or I've heard you've really been going through some challenges. Or... I'm concerned. I've heard some things about your family. And it seems like you guys are under a lot of stress right now. And that sense of community allows us to engage in humility that rather than hiding. You see, once you go into protection mode, it's only a matter of time before you're out of rooms like this. So we all have stuff to hide. And so just practice community and then practice confession. Practice confession. Confession is just acknowledging that we're guilty. I confess. I'm not coming up with reasons or rationalizations. I'm just sorry. Now, what's really fascinating is David, after he was confronted by Nathan, and he admitted to Nathan that he had sinned. He went and he found a quiet place, and he poured his heart out to God and the grace of God flowed so freely that those words of his prayer kind of came embedded in his mind, and he actually wrote them down and put them in the form of a lyric of a song. And we have them available to us today. It's Psalm 51. And so this morning, in community, we are going to practice confession. So I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way forward, but I'd like everyone else just to stand. And we're going to read these words of David that were so open and vulnerable and humble 
that it allowed the free flow of grace into his life. Didn't mean there were no consequences he didn't have to deal with. He had lots of those. But he never had to worry or wonder for a minute if the God of all the heavens and the earth wasn't in his corner. Because he prayed a prayer like this. Let's pray this out loud and together. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Amen. Let's let our mouth declare his praises. Say, oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing your praise, oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Come on, let it That's what happens when we practice community and we practice confession. Grace flows freely into us, and when that happens, the only thing left for us is praise. Grateful for a God who intervened in our lives, who cared enough to tell us when we're on the wrong path. We have a lot to learn from a guy like King Saul. So Father, help us today. Help us keep our ears open. Help us keep our hearts open to you. And help us respond in humble ways so your grace always flows freely towards us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. Honestly, the church has kind of a sordid past. Uh, you look throughout history, we haven't always gotten it right. There was actually a season in the church's history when by putting in a certain amount of money, you could actually cover up a sin you committed or get permission to commit one. They were called indulgences. And uh, the, the church went through a, a powerful reformation, and uh, that was addressed. Since that day, that has not been considered appropriate in, in Christianity. But here's what I want you to know. When we give offerings right now, if you're giving to cover up something or to pay down a debt that you think you owe to God, you need to know that will always be inadequate. There's no amount of money you can pay that will make up that difference. The only one who could pay that price was Jesus, and he did that for us on the cross of Calvary. There's nothing you can add to that. The reason we give is not because we feel guilt. The reason we give is because we want the grace of God to be expanded beyond just the people who are in this room. 
there's a whole world who hasn't yet heard about his goodness and his graciousness. That's why we give. So Father, take these gifts that we offer freely because you've been so gracious to us and use them to help others learn of your goodness. In Jesus' name.